is the way we are in here. Uh, so welcome to everybody, wherever you are, and I'm going to welcome another family, a couple of families uh, in just a few minutes. We, we leave that to the, the moment uh, when that's going to happen. But I do need to tell you that uh, we have a baptism this morning. I've just noticed, David, you see where the baptism font is sitting? It's not quite sitting in the middle. You would like to jump up and pull it over a little bit? That... that that would disturb me all the way through the service, looking at that stuff. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, right about. <laughs> what? That way. That way. Right? Perfect. Now, there's a reason for doing that, so I need, and I need to tell you this anyway, because at, at a point in this service, the camera on this tripod in front of me is going to move into the aisle and point that way. So I need to tell you that because the lead isn't long enough to get all the way down there, so it's going to sit round about where Mark and Norma are. Uh, and that means that if you're on the edge of that aisle, um, you're going to appear in the far corners of the globe. So if... if <laughs> If there are some people in another part of the world think you're somewhere else other than here uh, and you, you want to disappear, feel free to squeeze outwards or make a rush for the toilet at that point. Now, obviously, it's just a wee camera on a phone, so it's not, uh, you're not going to be terribly clear uh, all over the world. But just to let you know, the camera will be pointing backwards uh, for about 10 minutes in the middle of the service. Now, uh, let me check. What else? Just make sure we're doing everything that we should do. Um, this is the first Sunday of Advent. And Advent isn't just the run-up to Christmas. It has its own purpose. It has its own themes. And has its own call to us. And today we're going to be thinking about the Advent promise. And the need to be realizing that new starts and faith and resilience are required uh, for the Advent promise. So that will be the theme running through our Bible readings and our music and everything that we're doing today. And I'll be sharing a little bit about that later on. So I don't want you to think we've forgotten to light the candle. That will happen uh, later on in the service. But let's just take a wee moment of stillness as we think about the possibility that God has broken into our world and given us a promise. Uh, let's put our masks on for singing, so let's stand. <coughs>
you just remind us today of your promise to us and of, of your reaching out into our world and into us right here in this Beaver Parish Church. Please be seated. Uh, and thank you for that little child's voice. It feels like a long time since we've had little children's voices interrupting us because they're now out there, but that's good. So uh, our service is going to continue now with the baptism. So um, I, I want to, uh, we need to introduce the Knoxes and the Fords are down here. And uh, we'll get the... Uh, uh, the little baby's name in just a wee minute. Oh, that doesn't mean I've forgotten it, I know it, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll let that be part of the service. Uh, so, um, the uh, little baby, oh, it's Iona, okay, right? I, Iona's granddad uh, is the Dean of St. Anne's. Is it okay to say that, Stephen? You, you're happy for me to say St. Anne's Cathedral down in Belfast, which is my favorite other church to this one. Uh, and uh, Stephen is actually going to do the baptism. So uh, how this works is I'm going to ask you, the congregation, the usual questions about our commitment to this baptism today. And then Sandy is going to sing. And at that point, we'll start to turn around to face the font and the camera will move. And Stephen, that'll be the point for you to come out and make sure you get the family arranged uh, around the font down here. And for the first time, we're actually baptizing out of the Kintsugi Bowl. Is, is on the, the font today. Uh, so, right, now, let's, let's carry on with the baptism. So there should be some questions uh, addressed to the congregation. Do you, the Christian families gathered here for worship, promise to provide the living context of faith, hope, and love so that this child can grow up naturally and easily knowing and loving God? We do. Do you promise to be a support to these parents who cannot raise their child alone in the faith, but will always need your prayers and encouragement. We do. Since it is your will that Iona should be baptized in this holy faith, I ask you, along with her parents and godparents, to stand, and then we'll turn towards the font. Wash my soul in that pure water. Wash me clean in that cool river. Lord, make me new. Wash me clean in that cool river. Wash my soul. Wash me clean in that cool river, Lord, make me new. Wash me clean in that cool river, Lord, wash my soul. First, can I thank Adrian and you, the uh, family of Beaver Parish, uh, for allowing me to baptize my granddaughter uh, and uh, for the welcome that you've given to uh, the Knox family as they have made their home amongst you. Can I bring you greetings from St. Anne's Cathedral, Belfast? And I'm also going to let you into a little secret, which not a lot of people know, but Adrian said earlier that St. Anne's is his second favorite place after Beaver. There's a reason for that. I think I'm right in saying that Adrian was once a chorister in Belfast Cathedral. In fact, more than that, he was senior chorister in Belfast Cathedral. So there's another side to Adrian. 
which he keeps well hidden. But perhaps if you dressed him up in a cassock and a surplice and asked him to sing even song, he might just be able to do it. So it's wonderful to be here, and uh, Adrian has already referred to the bowl in which uh, Iona is going to be baptized. And I think this is absolutely amazing. This is this Americ uh, the Japanese idea that if you have a broken bowl, you uh, put it together, but you don't hide it the way most of us try to. If you break a plate or the handle comes off a cup, we always try and put the handle back on and hide it. But with this art form, you celebrate the fact that you're putting together the bits that are broken. So the bowl is black and the, the glue is beautiful gold. And that says something incredibly powerful about baptism, doesn't it? Because God takes us as we are, our broken pieces, and he puts us back together as a whole new creation in baptism. He makes us a new person, born again in the waters of baptism, with the glue of God's love and the power of Christ's restoration. So we're taking this broken bowl and through it we are going to baptize little Iona and uh, declare God's recreation of us in baptism. Now the other thing I can say to you is that the godparents aren't actually with us here in Beaver. Uh, Michael and Helen are in Derbyshire but I think they are watching us so they are very much part of what is happening. So my first question is to Helen and to Michael in Derbyshire and to David and Amy who are here as parents. So godparents and parents, I ask, will you accept the responsibilities placed upon you in bringing this child for her baptism? By your own prayers and example, by your teaching and your love, will you encourage her in the life and faith of the Christian community? Heavenly Father, who at the baptism of Jesus Christ in the River Jordan declared him to be your only begotten Son, grant that by your Spirit this child may be born again and made your child by adoption and grace through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, as I'm holding on to this uh, font uh, so that Eloise doesn't push it over. <laughs> That's the great thing about portable fonts. I'm going to share with you the scripture reading that is at the heart of the baptismal service. From Luke chapter 18. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And so, in baptism, God calls us from darkness into his marvelous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin and rising to new life in him. Therefore, I ask you, David and Amy, and Helen and Michael, these questions. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you then renounce the devil and all his works? I do, by God's help. Will you obey and serve Christ? I will, by God's help. And my question to all of you as the family of Beaver, and the answer will appear shortly. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to profess together the faith of the church. So I ask do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I ask, do you believe and trust in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. On, and so I ask, do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Now we come to a very important part of the service. We have gathered in this family a great granny who, you shouldn't say the age of a person who's older, should you? But are you, go are you going to tell us? No. no. <laughs> well, let, let, us, let us say that uh, great granny has seen nine decades of life. <laughs> and if Iona lives as long, she will be uh, a great granny perhaps in the middle of the 22nd century, which is a long way away. So on the one hand, we have a little tiny baby, and on the other hand, we have a great granny, and there is the line of faith, of Christian faith, that has been passed on uh, from mum to son to son to great-granddaughter. And in the middle of the mix, we have Eloise, who's big sister to Iona. And in order to have a baptism, you've got to have three things. You've got to have a baby. So who's the baby that we have? Iola. Yes. And you also have to have water. And we have water in a jug. And the third thing is you need to pour the water into the bowl in the font. So could Eloise help me pour the water into the font? Can you do that? Can you stand on this step? I tell you what, other granny will, will help you. Now, you pour the water in, and I know because this is beaver, you're allowed to have lots of water and a great big splash, okay? So we pour it in. You hold the jug. You hold the jug while you pour it in. Is it too heavy? Oh, with water everywhere. Hang on. That's great. Oh, Adrian will be cross with me now because I've spilt water everywhere. But... The good people of Beaver have given lots of cloths and towels for wiping it up. Cross in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that we have water, now that we have a baby, we're going to say together, praise God who made heaven and earth, who keeps his promises forever. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water to sustain, refresh, and cleanse all life. Over the water, the Holy Spirit moved at the beginning of creation. Through water, you led the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. In water, your son, Jesus Christ, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us from death into the newness of life. We thank you, Father, for this water of baptism, for in it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection, and through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we baptize into his fellowship all those who come to him in faith. Now we pray, sanctify this water, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, this child may be cleansed from sin and born again, renewed in your image, and may she walk by the light of faith and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Now, turning to Amy and to David, I ask, name this child. Iona, Lily, Jane. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that you have entered upon the Christian life, I sign you with the sign of the cross to show that you must not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil, and so continue as Christ's faithful soldier and servant until your life's end. Now, there's a part where we all join together, 
as a congregation to welcome Iona, Lily, Jane, as a new member of the worldwide family of the church. And although we're in COVID times, I'm going to go for a little walk because Iona is now your new sister and a member of your family. So we say together, now that you have entered... No, we don't. God has adopted you by baptism. she's being baptized and because it's like a bath. And so let us pray for Iona. Almighty God, bless the home of this child and give such grace and wisdom to all who have the care of her that by their word and good example they may teach her to know and love you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, uh, and thank you, Iona. Uh, that has been lovely uh, and very meaningful too when we think about this Advent Sunday and God's promise to us. A voice of one calling in the wilderness is a very strong Advent kind of theme. Well, we're in the sermon, by the way, in case you're wondering what's happening now. <laughs> okay, so uh, get your barley sugars out or whatever it is you all do. Uh, and settle down. <laughs> right. An Old Testament prophet. These strange characters from the Old Testament, uh, some of whom wrote the biggest and longest of the books in the Bible, and uh, we always struggle to get them read and struggle even more to maybe understand what's going on in there or who they even were or where they were or what they were doing. So uh, I find this in a book this week about an Old Testament prophet is someone who has a specific message to specific people at a specific point in history. And they tended to be people sometimes uh, in the Old Testament. So the, the famous ones are Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but then there's any number of others, Obadiah and Nahum and Joel and Micah uh, and all sorts of people in there. And they tended to either be somebody who lived out at the edge of society and occasionally visited the mainstream centers of the faith like Jerusalem uh, with a preaching message and they would have delivered that maybe in the streets or in the marketplaces and then disappeared back to their agricultural backgrounds or whatever. Or they were sometimes almost, you could describe them as in the, in the employment of the government. Uh, so someone like Isaiah is at the heart of the temple practices uh, in the middle of Jerusalem. Others have been uh, Elijah is another obvious one who clearly has access to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel because you, I'm sure you know the stories. Uh, there's uh, interaction going on between them and threat and uh, challenge and all sorts of things. So sometimes these prophets are right at the heart of society and even at the heart of government. But they always bring a message from God for a moment or for a period of time in the history of Israel and in the history of this faith that we are now part of. So I want to just um, try to put this Advent promise into the context of history. Uh, so something is going to work its way across the screen here. The promise was first given to an elderly couple, Abraham and Sarah, kind of minding their own business, uh, looking after their farm, and into the midst of this comes the presence of God uh, and the voice of God spoken through these strangers who came to visit them. And the promise was that from your son, and they didn't have a son at the time, and they were very old, but that they will have a son. And through their son, 
their son will be the beginning of a family, of a faith, of a way of life, of a relationship with God that will one day be more numerous than the grains of sand on the beach or the stars in the sky. That was the promise. And this would be a blessing to the whole of creation, to the whole of humankind. That's the promise. And it had to be accepted by faith, by Abraham and Sarah. And it was. And then history leaps forwards. Well, it doesn't leap forwards. It goes forward slowly like it always does. But on our screen, it leaps forwards uh, over 500 years. Uh, Their son Isaac leads on to their son Jacob. And we all know Jacob because he's the one who uh, married two sisters uh, and a collection of uh, slaves as well uh, and ended up with at least 12 sons and some other people. And uh, that leads us to a, a dip in the story. Right? From this thing that started full of faith and promise and the, the possibility of it taking a long time, because obviously this has to grow through the reproduction of this family. Uh, but we end up with, with the one who is sort of carrying the promise, Joseph, known to us through musicals, uh, ends up in Egypt. And the story after Joseph dies and the Israelites continue to grow in Egypt, it ends up in a situation of slavery where they become so numerous that Pharaoh and successive Pharaohs decide they need to squash this thing. So for, and you can see the times, times before Christ go in reverse. Is that okay? In case you're thinking the numbers seem to get smaller. You're working your way towards Christ. Uh, So there's, there's a couple of hundred years in there in slavery. When you could have been forgiven for not thinking the promise is worth anything. What does this promise of God mean? And then somehow in the midst of all of that, um, God begins to stir things again. And Moses appears. And Moses ends up challenging Pharaoh and saying, this people, these people that you have enslaved have a promise over them. And this promise needs to be lived out. Uh, God has told me to tell you that he wants you to set his people free because there's a promised land. And notice the name, it's the promised land a new place for them, a place that is to be theirs where they will start to live out this faith again and where the promise will have a a chance of becoming a reality. So we know about Exodus, we know about the Ten Commandments in the wilderness and the move into Canaan across the River Jordan. And uh, then we move into another period of time and it lasts again two, three hundred years when they're just living as sort of random tribes on the land. And um, The judges, most famous of them being Gideon and Samson, probably Deborah uh, and some others, are the people who kind of keep stirring the faith among these people. But things don't go well. And it's almost like this promised land is the land without promise. And they get to the point where they're being so harassed by the other uh, nations around them, the other tribes around them, that they decide that they would like to be like the other tribes. And they plead with God for a king. We would like a monarchy, a royal family. And of course, you know the, uh, how this develops, that Saul, followed by David, followed by Solomon, are the most famous of, those, uh, of the royalty. That then, and that's the, the golden age of Israel under David and Solomon's leadership, where it expands and grows and becomes like the big successful nations that are around them. But was that the promise? Was that what God was promising? Was political prosperity? Or was he speaking something else into the hearts of into the heart of this movement of people? Well, anyway. We get to the end of Solomon's reign, and Solomon has two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And this is where the Old Testament actually starts to get very complex. If you're ever reading uh, Kings and Samuel, uh, the Samuel books and the Chronicles, um, because these two can't agree over who ought to take charge, so they end up splitting Israel in two. And Jeroboam takes the northern part that he calls Israel, and Rehoboam takes the southern part that he calls Judah. And like we live in a wee land where we know mm, it's hard to make that work, isn't it? When you split things up and put borders in. So 
Well, Israel now looks like this. The southern part, the mustard color, includes Jerusalem. You can see that there, sitting beside the, uh, the Dead Sea. And the northern part in blue, and Samaria is kind of the capital of it. And we're beginning to see, do you remember later when we get to the Jesus story, Samaritans and Jews not getting on well? And the Sea of Galilee is up in that northern part, so Nazareth and lots of the places where we know of our Jesus stories are all going to happen up in there. Could I just say the promise is blown out of the water here with this division, with this separation? And the succession of kings, let's go back to, oh, no, let's go on. Succession of kings, both north and south, um, are a mixture of occasionally you get one who's faithful to God, but mostly they are unfaithful people and they embrace all sorts of faiths around them, all sorts of practices. Uh, one of them even introduces, uh, sorry, in the northern place in Samaria, they also build a replica temple of the one in Jerusalem. Uh, but they introduce right down to things like child sacrifices. These are horrendous years. And it's a long period of time for this movement of God to lose sight of its promise. Now, do you see that big star with 700 in it? That's a year. So let me jump back a picture. Just to the north of Samaria, there's a great big other country called Assyria. And it has had its eyes on the northern part of Israel for quite a while. And at that wee point where that big star appears, they march into Israel and they take the northern half. Remember I said it was split up into two, right? They come right down to that mustard-colored bit. And they take it all. And for the next number of years, not only is this sense of God living out his promise through us, of bringing about our people and our faith and what God's doing with us to be a blessing to the world. They're just living under curse. All the prosperity is sent to Assyria. Everything goes that direction. Uh, the northern half of Israel is very fertile. The agriculture is used to keep the Assyrian empire going. Everything of their hope and their promise is destroyed now, just in case you thought Assyria was bad, over to the right on the map, there's an even bigger crowd called Babylon, the Babylonians. And they were watching all of this and thinking, uh, we could make a bit out of this as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm simplifying centuries of history there. <laughs> well, they thought we could make a bit out of this. Okay, but you know how it works? So the southern half is still free, that, that bottom line. They're still living out their worship and all in the temple, but they've got awful rulers, uh, terrible things going on. And so the wee blue names on this are the prophets that are speaking and preaching into all of this. Anyway, the whole thing goes along. And a hundred years later, approximately, these figures are all approximate, but a hundred years later, don't the, the Babylonians come across Assyria and down into the northern part of Israel and then right down into the southern part of Israel. And they do two other things that the Assyrians hadn't done. They destroy Jerusalem. They flatten the temple. The place where God lives is gone. And I don't know if you remember two summers ago when Tom Keatley spoke to us on our screens and he said that if you flatten the temple and God isn't there, then maybe he's dead. To the Israelites, to the carriers of the promise, maybe God's dead. And you can see on the wee thing there, the first deportation. Anyone of any value, according to the Babylonians, is taken out of Israel and taken to the far corners of this huge empire. Yeah? This huge empire that stretches away over into the countries we would know as Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and all of that. And they're working there in the agriculture and the civil service. We know some of them did well. We know that Daniel was one of them. Uh, and he was very successful at his new job in there. But they were far, far, far away from where they wanted to be. They were dispersed. Uh, their faith was being eaten into, being destroyed. They didn't have the place for the sacrifices and the temple and the worship and the priests and everything that they thought was part of their promise. 
is destroyed. And then, a lone voice. Jeremiah, back in Jerusalem, he's a young man, starts to speak and gets this written down and is sent out by messengers across this dispersed people, across nations, across deserts, in wildernesses, in slavery, in exile, under huge threat. And his words, now there's a huge book of it, right? But here's his words for today, the Advent reading. The Lord said, this is Jeremiah saying this, the Lord said, I made a wonderful promise to Israel and Judah, and the days are coming when I will keep it. I promise that the time will come when I will appoint a king from the family of David, a king who will be honest and rule with justice. In those days, Judah will be safe, Jerusalem will have peace, and will be named the Lord gives justice. Now, you can see why we do Advent just before Christmas, because the promise is about Bethlehem. It's about what's going to come out of the seed of David. That will be the fulfillment of this promise made all those centuries ago, nearly 2,000 years earlier, to an elderly couple looking after their farm. Now, if we jump back from 600, Jeremiah's writing around that. It's about 400 years, 400 years before there's anything visible and tangible that looks like this promise. And I'm preempting some of the Christmas story. But look at this. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple, just like this morning, to do what the law of Moses says should be done for a new baby, the Spirit told Simeon, who was this elderly man in the temple, to go into the temple. Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God. And he said, Lord, I'm your servant. And now I can die in peace because you have kept your promise to me. With my own eyes, I have seen what you have done to save your people, and foreign nations will also see this. Your mighty power is a light for all nations. Can you imagine 400 years later, this little baby is born in Bethlehem, and his parents take him up to Jerusalem um, to, to go through the kind of purification and the anointing and the welcoming of this child into the faith. And there's someone there who's waiting for the promise. Now, you need to know by the time this is all happening, Babylonians have gone. Persians, who were even worse, have taken over all of it. And the Romans hadn't even been thought of. By the time this baby's in Jerusalem, you can hear the armor of the Roman soldiers in the streets outside. This place is still clinging by its fingernails to the promise of God. And here's this man who's been waiting and watching. And there's another person, a woman, described as a prophet. Anna was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She was 84 years old. Night and day she served God in the temple by praying and often going without eating. At that time, Anna came in and praised God. She spoke about the child Jesus to everyone, who hoped for Jerusalem to be set free. In the midst of everything, there are people clinging to the promise. In the midst of everything that looks like it's going wrong, there are people holding on to the promise. Jesus was born. We're going to remember that in our Christmas story. And it's important for us to revisit the promise And it's important for us to retell our story in our world, to keep our story alive. So I was picking Christmas cards yesterday, and I do love wee robins and snow scenes and everything else, but you've got to pick some Christmas cards about the story and send them to a few people or give them out. Keep the story being told about the promise across all these centuries. The promise is still alive and active. And at Christmas, that first Christmas at Bethlehem, the promise becomes a tangible reality in the life of this baby. 
who is the Son of God, who is God the Son, and who is the beginning of the promise being fulfilled. But here's the challenge. The promise began to be fulfilled in that tangible, physical, incarnational way. But it's not complete. It isn't complete yet. And Advent is the season when we remember we're in that period of time from when the promise started to become the reality for the world in the death and resurrection of the Christ to that point when it is finished. And we're in here. And so far it's been 2,000 years and we're at this point of the 2,000 years and we don't know if it's tomorrow or if it's another 2,000 or what it is, but the promise will be completed. And just like the Israelites through all that Old Testament of ups and downs, slaveries and exiles, of slaughters and temples destroyed and everything that went wrong at times, there were always people who held the promise. And they kept telling the story. And we're going to tell our story again this Christmas. And then at Easter, we're going to tell the next bit of the story. And at Pentecost, we're going to tell the next bit of the story. And in whatever way we can, we want to tell the story. And you know what? 2,000 years on, from the beginning of the promise becoming a reality, there have been world wars, there have been famines, there have been pestilences. In our own part of the world, there have been divisions in our land. There have been troubles and terrorism and bombs and killings. Um, And more recently, there's been a pandemic that has circled our globe. And yet coming up, and I practice this at home, coming up to the end of the first quartile of the 21st century, 21 centuries after it began. A random group of people sit down in a little church on the side of a dual carriageway when the world out there generally just ignores us. And we sit down in here because we hold to the promise the promise that he is redeeming his world. We're going to tell our story again this Christmas. We're going to hold to our promise, to his promise. And Simeon and Anna were there when they saw the promise starting to be fulfilled. But think of all of the others who had been in that temple hoping and waiting and never saw it. It doesn't matter whether you get to see it complete. We hold on to it anyway. I did think about running in the Belfast Marathon. Sorry, I have done that. And uh, if if you're number three in the relay and you're given the armband, if you decide to go home, it won't get completed. You have to faithfully take your armband and run your four miles or whatever it is and give it to the next person. And one person will be the one who crosses the line. Our task is to hold to the promise, hold to it faithfully, and pass it on. We're going to do that again this Christmas. And whatever our world looks like out there, It can't look any worse than it must have been living in exile in Assyria or Babylon or Persia. They held to the promise. And maybe the church of Jesus Christ in 2021 is like a wee voice in the desert. It's a huge big world, but we're going to light little candle and we're going to say Lord 
we believe your promise. We hold to your promise that you are changing and redeeming your world and that one day it will complete, it will be complete and you will be in it. So no matter how dim this little candle may be, we're holding to the promise. Would you like to put on your mask and stand? Please be seated. Let's pray together. Abba, Father and creator of all life, we ask you to bless Amy and David as they celebrate the baptism of Iona. Watch over them, Lord, that they may be examples of your love, peace, and joy to their children, Eloise and Iona. Bless Iona's godparents as they commit to support this newly baptized child. Guide them as they offer help and support to Iona now and throughout their amazing journey of life. Bless the grandparents and, go- and great-grandparent as they see their family growing. Encourage them to pass on their wisdom with gentleness and truth, offering love and joy to parents and to children. 
bless this family's circle of friends as they as their lives change and move on. Inspire them to be a lis listening presence, a calming influence, and a source of joy as they all share new experiences together. And we pray similar for ourselves, our families and friends. Loving God, watch over and protect us all. Amen. Loving God, we pray for all children especially today, Iona and Eloise, and all the children of this church. We pray that they know and feel the security that is their right. We pray that they know and feel the love that is theirs through you. Guide all who are a voice for children and young people to speak loudly and clearly so that security and safety, love and hope might be the experience of all your children. Amen. And our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth, on earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those, those who trespass, who trespass against, against us. us. And, and lead, lead us not, not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver, deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom the, the power and the glory, and the glory forever, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sandy. Well, we're going to sing our last uh, hymn today in just a wee moment, but there's something else we've got to do as well. We're saying cheerio to Stu. Oh, Okay. Uh, has it been 10 weeks? Wow. Okay. But in the strangeness that is everything that we're doing, it has just continued to be that. Uh, so Stu finishes with us this morning here in Beaver. Uh, and Stu, it has been lovely and, uh, and warm, and we've had great chats, and you've joined in with all sorts of things, from playing guitars to preaching and leading and everything else, and wearing, could I say, ridiculous jumpers, right? <laughs> Would you like to stand for a wee moment just to let, look at this. I'd have thought a little bit early, but he was down to do it, wasn't he? <laughs> ah, okay. Well done, Stu. Ah. You've been hanging around for a wee cup of coffee so people can say cheerio to you. And it's back to college until, uh, obviously, the summer finishes this year. And then next year, you'll be doing what Rodney did with us. You'll be in a parish for the whole of that year while writing your dissertation. Okay. So you'll be getting ordained summer coming? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, Lord, would you just, as you have led your call on Stu over a number of years, because we've heard part of the story, uh, Lord, would you just um, reassure him of that? Because like everything we've thought about this morning, there must be moments of doubt and fear. Uh, so Lord, just on him and the, the whole family, children and everything, may they just sense uh, your direction and your purpose is working out. And those big moments of finding churches and places to be deacon and places to be curate and rector and everything, Lord, may he just know that, that you're there every step of the way ahead of him as well as beside him. And bless him too, because he also blesses all of us by his work with summer madness. So Lord, would you just give him uh, enthusiasm and inspiration for all of that. Uh, and for John sitting here behind me as well. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Stu. Wow. Yes, so if we haven't thought of this, would somebody get down to the shops and get a packet of jammy dodgers quick <laughs> <laughs> or something okay oh and i should say that too to the our baptism family if you haven't been here before we do do coffee and tea outside in the freezing cold uh, during the summer it was absolutely lovely and there are picnic tables but at the minute uh there um, there's a gazebo out there but there is something else coming between now and christmas right so uh just get ready for that hey Right, let's stand and sing another Advent hymn that captures this sense of God has begun something and will bring it to completion. 
Let's start. And the collect of this Advent Sunday, Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who is alive, and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Take a seat for a wee moment. Uh, and let, let's just finish. Let me just add one other wee prayer. Lord, on this Advent Sunday, we thank you that the baton, the armband of the promise and of the faith and of hope has been brought to us. And today we want to say to you, we will take it and wear it and carry it. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, remain with you always. Amen. Okay, we're about to, to leave. Um, the um, welcome team will help you get out so we don't all just rush for the door. Uh, and the other thing to say is that tonight at 7 o'clock, uh, our evening service, which is quite a quiet, informal, um, lots of music, not much preaching kind of thing. We're having communion tonight at 7 o'clock, first time. Next Sunday morning, we'll be having communion here at 11 o'clock, which will also be first time. So you're all very welcome, and it will be done carefully and safely. Uh, please be assured of that. So I think that's everything that's going to scroll on the screens, and then you'll find it on Facebook and on the website and everything else, but I'm going to grab my coat and hat and head for the coffee. First one out there gets a cappuccino, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I got a hat. Okay.